good evening. Welcome back to Book Talk with the three of us. Uh, we uh, This is the fifth in our series, and tonight we're going to be talking about publishing agreements. We've talked uh, in the series about the process of, pub, of writing and publishing. We've talked about editors and working with them and the, all the ins and outs of uh, the process. So tonight we'll talk about actually uh, working um, on making your agreement with an editor or a book uh, publisher. So I think, Mike, you wanted to start off with something? Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, publishing, yourself, in self-publishing, probably your biggest um, decision you need to make is whether you wanna go exclusive with one publisher or go what they, as they say, go wide, meaning you're not bound to anybody. Um, typically when it's, when you're going exclusive, it typically means you're just going with Amazon. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both, you know, ways. Um, in terms of book publishing, um, if you go with Amazon, um, one of the things you could do is if you go exclusive with Amazon is you get enrolled in the, you get enrolled in the Kindle Unlimited program. Now, what that means is you don't get money for selling books, but you get money for borrows and pages read. So if a lot of people read your book, you, you don't get a royalty for the purchase of the book, but you get credit um, for the pages read. And that can be, that can be significant in some cases. Um, you, if it gets popular and lots of people read it, and you have lots of pages. <laughs> um, yeah, but the, um, and with Amazon, you can also do a print book um, that's pretty much limited to paperback, but you could have a paperback book available to be purchased on Amazon as well as the ebook. Um, so the disadvantages of that is if you want to sell to other ebook platforms, you can't at all. And there are a number of good ebook platforms out there. I mean, um, that that all have their pluses and minuses um, and their own audiences. Um, the other drawback is if you purchase, if you go exclusively exclusively through Amazon, it makes it a lot more difficult for you to get your books in other places like libraries or or even independent bookstores because. The way bookstores and even libraries, you know, sort of do this is they purchase the book, especially bookstores, purchase it at a discounted price. Well, if you're, if they're purchasing from Amazon, they are not, they don't get a discount and they're helping their competitor, you know, <laughs> so they can stock the book. So, you know, if, if the book's on sale for $9.99 on Amazon, they have to pay $9.99 on Amazon and then they have to, would have to mark it up in order to make any money. So why would anybody buy the book in the bookstore if it's more expensive than it is on Amazon? So if you're non-exclusive, it gives you options to do other things. Um, one of the one of the other places you can go to do book publishing is Ingram Spark. I know there are others. I I use Ingram Spark. And besides doing the paperback that you can do in Amazon, you can also do hardcover and you can also do large print as well. Um, <clears throat> so that gives you options for, you know, more options of things to sell. So there are pluses and minuses, like I said, to both. Um, same thing kind of goes in the audio world as well. Um, you can go exclusive through Audible, which is Amazon's audiobook arm um or you could go wide and you you'd still be able to distribute on amazon but um i believe you get a little less in royalty from amazon but there are other other networks that you would get you know you could potentially get more royalty from so that's kind of it on the exclusive non-exclusive thing um it's something to consider it all depends on what it is you hope to do with your with your project when you Right. Um, sorry, I, th I think you hung up for a second, or at least I did. Maybe I did. Um, <laughs> so
so that that's from the self-publishing point of view mostly right um yes completely from the self-publishing right right so in the publishing world if you're going to work through a publisher um i think brian can probably give us a lot more insight on that yeah mike that was a really good um intro to this whole thing mm. with regard to the kinds of things that the writer should be aware of and, and interested in and of course the first and foremost is the copyright and kind of owning the rights to what you're what you're writing and publishing um, it's a little more difficult when you're self-publishing through somebody like Amazon because they take not just a little bit more per book they take a lot more per book um, so some people will will be um, will shy away from that because they'll realize they're they're unlikely to make much, if any, profit. But many people like yourself are not in, in for it for the short run. They're in it for the long run. And they know that the second and the third book and subsequent publishings and, and residuals, um, royalties from other products will, will come uh, pretty freely. Um, <laughs> when, when I, <laughs> well, it's a relative term, but I mean, if there's a catchphrase that comes out of one of Mike's novels in the Reluctant series um, and it goes on a t-shirt or a coffee mug or something like that, he wants to make sure he's going to have some return from that and it's not all going to go to Amazon or right. uh, Ingram or whoever he, he chose to, to self-publish through. But self-publishing is a good way to go if you're uh, not able to secure uh, a publishing contract. Um, a lot of people who uh, tend toward an ebook because it's so much less expensive to produce. Will put their first ebook on Amazon or wherever mm -hmm. free, free of charge. So people will pick it up as free content and get to know you as a writer. And then the second or third book is where you'll actually make a pretty good uh, chunk of money. Um, from a publishing standpoint, I always write my contracts in very sim simple English. And I kind of can winnow out the, um, the authors that I want to work with from the authors who expect more legalese and want something that's much more official. I don't want to work with those people anyway. But I'll, I'll have a one or two page summary that will say things like, the author will receive X percent of net profits. Um, uh, the, the author will retain copyright or the author and publisher will have joint copyright. Generally, I don't give that up in first printing um, because there are so many other possible uses for the copyright, but ultimately the author needs to know um, the following things. And I would, I would kind of list them this way. You want to make sure that you're getting a fair percentage of the net profits. Now, fair is a relative term. If the publisher is going to pay four, $5 per book, seven, $8 per book, depending on the book and the number printed, to print the book, they're going to take that off the top. So your net profit is going to be with that taken out. Um, most first time authors earn between eight and 12 and a half percent. Some earn 20, uh, 15 or to 20 percent. Um, but mostly it's on the lower end of that. That's okay if you're not putting out a lot of money for the initial printing. Um, but ultimately you want a percentage you can live with. If you're in writing, we talked about this before, just to make money, you're not going to be a very good writer. No. And as I said, the most notable exception is probably Edgar Allan Poe, who <laughs> made no bones about the fact that he was writing just for the money, but was a pretty good writer anyway. Mm. Um, that's not always the case if profit is yeah. your motive. So joint or whole copyright, a red flag is if the publisher says they want to own the copyright because then you've lost control over the, the system completely. That would be one thing. Another thing is percentage of the net profit that you're going to receive. And the net profit is what the publisher will pay you after they've covered their expenses for the, mm -hmm. the printing of the book. Um, you want to know what's going to happen with um, other rights. What are, what are the royalties for things that are not a print or an ebook? Um, T-shirts, uh, coffee mugs, um, in the case of my Tree Trolls book, um, stuffed, stuffed action figures, that kind of thing. You want to make sure that as the author, you retain a fair amount of the profit from those things. 
because the publisher will try to get whatever they can um, out of that if you're not careful. Um, but the main thing is you have to have what amounts to um, a handshake agreement confidence in your publisher that they're in it for the betterment of your writing career, not just the betterment of their own bottom line. Um, most first time, first time authors are gonna work with a small publisher or gonna self publish. That's not a bad thing, but uh, you wanna make sure that while you're not in it for the money, that you do end up making some kind of money. Um, self publishing agreements that tell you after we sell the first 500, you'll start to make money, generally are not too attractive to most authors and they shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it is important that if you get one of those legally um, worded eight page or 20 page documents that is that you're supposed to sign as an author, that you go over it with someone with a legal background, possibly a publishing agent or somebody who works um, in the legal, in the publishing, legal side of publishing, the publishing world. Mm -hmm. um, they can slip in things that really hurt you if you're not careful. Um, confidence in your publisher, if, if, I think is really important, whether that is Amazon or Log Cabin Books or mm -hmm. you know, Harcourt Brace or whoever it happens to be. Sure. Yeah, I, I would add to one of the things to look for in, in traditional publishing deals mm -hmm. is um, how your advance plays into what you will make on your book afterwards. Because my understanding is the way that works is like they, they will give you an advance and you will not see any more money on that book until the publisher has made back your advance. You know whatever they sent you so if you signed in advance for two thousand dollars um you won't see any royalties on that book until your royalties have reached over two thousand dollars so mm -hmm. they make back their money there yeah and that's 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 a good point that is um becoming a little bit of an outdated notion because most authors most authors will turn down in advance for that very reason yeah. and most publishers for first-time authors are not offering um, right. in advance anymore. I mean, that it does happen sometimes, but, you know, Stephen King gets eight million before he starts writing a book. Yeah. But um, <laughs> for first-time authors, um, to accept an advance like that is usually telling the publisher, this is all I expect to make on this book. Um, and while it may take you a long time to make $2,000 uh, when you're getting a, a percentage of the net over, you know, two or three years or whatever it is, depending on how your book sales are, um, most people like to see steady profits, maybe quarterly, as opposed to getting a lump sum to begin with. That's really up to the author, though. Yeah. But I would be aware of that advancing for the vet, that very reason, Mike, because uh, it could leave you high and dry for a long time. And you might feel a little bit removed from the process and from the ownership. Um, when you publish through a publisher and you are really hot for your publisher to go to Amazon to list the book, uh, keep in mind that Amazon takes 55% of the net profit of the book. Wow. They're going to take a huge amount. They want a discount price of 55%. Most bookstores get 40%. So if you you print a book that retails for $10, bucks, um, you sell it to a bookstore for $6. Um, and if it costs you 4 bucks to print, then you've only made 2 bucks prof net profit or profit at all. Um, if you sell, if you print a book that retails for 10 bucks and you sell it to Amazon, you get $4 and 50 cents back. Um, that's, that's what they're paying you for the book. And chances are you're barely going to cover your printing costs or your production costs. If you put in everything from editing to illustration and art and everything else. So, uh, I'm a little bit, oh, um, wary. I used to publish all, or, place all my books, sell my, all my books uh, on Amazon. And I, I frankly don't anymore because, and th this is known throughout the industry, they take such a huge cut that they don't live, they don't leave the, the publisher and the author with very much at all. That's different than the self-publishing Amazon. And I think that's a pretty good program they have for self-publishing. But when it's an outright book, I tell my authors, the primary place to drive people to sell this book is to my website because then we get 100% of the retail as opposed to 45%. Yep. 
So just a word of caution. But your publisher knows about that. You just have to trust them. Yeah. They want to make money too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd also add to go back to something you said about copyright. That's really important that you know who owns mm -hmm. the copyright because mm -hmm. I do know from listening to a lot of different podcasts and stuff, traditional publishers, the big publishers, they want to own the copyright. Mm -hmm. And copyright goes for the life of of the author plus 70 years right so um <clears throat> and publishers want that copyright as you obviously would guess uh, um so you have to be very careful if you want to give that away or make sure there are ways that you can get the copyright back um, right and that's very difficult once you give it up the reason that copyright is so important in case um you're wondering is copyright is basically the control of the use of the written words. Mm -hmm. um, if you own the copyright, you own the movie rights, you own the poster rights, you own the t-shirt rights and the coffee mug rights and the action figure rights. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot for an author to give up. If the contract you're looking at does not specifically say that you hold the copyright jointly or that you as the author own the copyright, do not sign it. Because wow. you're basically doing what's called work for hire. Work for hire is um, where you contract to provide something. Maybe you're an illustrator and you do work for hire to illustrate a book. You don't get a percentage of the sales, you get paid up front and then you're done. And an author should never feel like they're in a work for hire situation where once they've written the book and have been paid for that, they're done. <laughs> so you wanna make sure you retain the copyright for the reasons Mike just mentioned. Yeah. An interesting story. I think I read somewhere that Margaret Atwood basically <clears throat> got no money for the the new Handmaid's Tale, um, Handmaiden's Tale TV series, mm -hmm. um, because when she signed her contract back in I think it was the '80s when she originally published it, mm -hmm. the movie rights and all of that stuff went to the publisher. Right. So by the time you know now, thirty years later. Um, you know, she's missed out on what could have been a substantial, you know, revenue stream. I guess. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And she was not entirely thrilled with the, uh, the scripts for the series either. I mean, they, they were largely, I think, in keeping with the, the spirit of the novel, but they were not completely yeah. um, in keeping with that. And she had nothing to say about it because she had given up that, that right. right. In retrospect, I'm sure she would have liked to have. Yeah, <laughs> that's a shame. Um, you mentioned joint copyright when you said um, mm -hmm. make sure it's either a co you own it or it's a joint copyright agreement. What does that entail for the writer? I mean, what is that? Well, it means for both parties that they can't um, use the material for the most part without the um, okay. approval of the other party. So just like the author doesn't want to be shut out like Margaret Atwood was right. um, of movie rights, et cetera, the publisher doesn't either because the publisher has invested time editing, um, probably layout and design, artistic uh, qualities. They've paid an illustrator, all those things. Um, and they don't want to see that go away either. So <clears throat> if you hold it jointly, it more or less implies that you're going to work as a team on whatever uses are made. Um, if you don't have that in there, joint copyright, and then um, the, that both parties retain the right to uh, approval on any subsequent use of the material, then you're setting yourself up for one or the other to be really unhappy. Wow. That's why it's important that you feel comfortable with your publisher mm -hmm. and you feel that they have your best interest at heart um, and that they're not just in it you know, to make money off you and then um, steal your product. Um, there, have, there have been writers for whom I've said, your work is so unique and so important and such intellectual property that I want to help you publish this book, but because I think you deserve the larger portion of profits, I want to help you publish it. You pay for the printing and then you get you know, the 80% or 75% or whatever. Um, I've done that with several books because the author 
probably could have found a bigger publisher and I was actually lucky to be in the mix. Mm -hmm. They like that. I haven't put up money up front. They have, but they have a good product. They're going to make good money off it. I'll make more than enough money to justify my um, partnership with them, but we hold a joint copyright so that all subsequent profits are shared as well. And that's a, that's a good marriage, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, th I think, you know, we've been really encouraging of authors that in every one of these episodes, we've said the important thing is write and be confident in yourself and, and use your own voice. You know, that phrase that Mike used that I just love, which is write the book you want to read. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think however you publish, you should publish. We talked last time about blogs and podcasts and other ways of publishing your work or serializing it in a, in a magazine or a journal or something like that. Um, find the agreement that, that makes you feel comfortable. Don't settle for less because you always resent the publisher or yourself for that. Um, sure. But whatever way you need to do it, get your words out there because it's, it's your expression, it's your fine art, and it's your voice that no one else can duplicate. So don't let an agreement stand in the way of that, but be careful, be aware of what you're signing. Absolutely, good advice. <laughs> Are there any last words for tonight? I think Mike started off great and put us in the right frame of mind, and uh, um, next time we'll wrap it up with what the whole publishing yeah, process or process, I think is what we were going to talk about. Sure. I don't know. We'll talk about whatever, I guess, when we get here. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. This has been great. Thank you both. I think I forgot to kind of introduce you again at the beginning. So we have Mike Tepp, uh, who is a local author and uh, Brian McDowell, who is a publisher and owner of Love and Earth. So thank you for coming tonight and we will see you next week for our final episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night.